You're listening to the USSC Briefing Room, a podcast from the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, where we give you a seat at the table for a USSC briefing on the latest developments in US news and foreign policy. We'll cover what you need to know and what's beneath the surface of the news. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia. The University of Sydney stands on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on, and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Hello, I'm Mari Kirk, Director of Engagement and Impact at the USSC, and today I'm delighted to welcome two USSC experts about a non-USSC project. We're joined by non-resident senior fellow Bruce Wolpe and research associate Victoria Cooper. Bruce worked with Democrats in Congress during President Obama's first term and was senior advisor to Prime Minister Julia Gillard. His third book, Trump's Australia, How Trumpism Changed Australia, and the Shocking Consequences for Us of a Second Term, has just been published, and Victoria Cooper worked as his research assistant on the book. Victoria is an Australian fellow in the World Learning Quad Think Tank Learning Program and was an Australian delegate to the Australia ASEAN Strategic Youth Partnership Forum. Prior to joining USSC, she was editor-in-chief of the Young Diplomat Society. Now, Bruce and Victoria, welcome to the show. I'm really looking forward to discussing your book. Uh, And just before we begin, I wanted to flag that towards the end of the episode, we're going to ask you to share your favorite by the numbers, fact or stat related to the book. Uh, Are you good to go on that? Yes. Yep. Great. Okay. So let's dive in. Um, I'm keen to get a sense of both the scale and the reach uh, you see former President Trump has had in his first term and what a second term would mean, especially for Australia. And Bruce, I have been saying this to Victoria, but the timing of your book release is just uncanny. You are launching your book the week after former President Trump was indicted of federal crimes. But you were reached out to by the publishers of the book as early as December 21 to write a about a potential third Trump presidential campaign. And this is well before he announced his intentions to run one year later and the whole Mar-a-Lago documents drama. Seems like a big risk to start writing and basically finish writing an entire book based on the presumption that Trump would eventually announce. So what made you so sure? And does this indictment change your views of anything? Uh, the indictment doesn't change my views of anything, but before we I answer the question, I just want to say I'm t- thrilled to be here with both of you. I mean, Victoria was a research assistant and uh, on, on the book, an editorial assistant on the book, and, and it was just fantastic to work together with you, Victoria. Thank you so much. And secondly, this book is independent of the work of the United States Study Center, even though both of us are associated with it. And I, we just want to make that clear to everyone who, who comes across the book. Uh, but and proud to be on this uh, USSC podcast, however, for uh, <laughs> uh, for it. Um, it. It was just my I've I've been involved in politics for a long time, uh, half a century, and I uh, have seen, grew up with it, loved it, participated in it, worked in Washington, worked in Canberra, and I uh, it was just my and I followed Trump assiduously throughout his first the campaign and the first term. And all that he did, and it was just my strong sense that he was not going away. He was intent on coming back, and intent on coming back for two reasons: first, to continue his agenda, but also to wreak vengeance on his enemies, and that he would come back as president, uh, knowing all the levers, knowing all the rooms, knowing where it all happens, knowing who is loyal and who is not, knowing how to uh, make sure he didn't make the same mistakes he made in the first term. Not as far as the country was concerned, but as far as his success was concerned. He wouldn't hire General Milley, would never serve again as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He would never have um, Bill Barr as attorney general. He would never, uh, he would get rid of all the people who impeded everything he wanted to do. And he, uh, and he also, he just never indicated any desire to leave the field. So I was um, sadly uh, for the world uh, confident that he would be uh, ongoing. And Malcolm Knox of Allen and Unwin came to me um, to explore a book. And it was their initiative. I had no intention of writing a book, but uh, we set, landed on, since I've specialized in American politics, have never written really on Australian politics. Well, wh- where, where is the um, landing zone for this? And the landing zone was, um, what happens to Australia if Trump comes back for a second term? So we get all of Trump, but reified through where Australian democracy, culture, society, foreign policy, and so forth. And, uh, and that led to a pretty systematic 
examination of all those topics, and then I could form some, uh, I could I could uh, form a picture of it, and outline what people were thinking involved in those policy areas, and then some recommendations as to what Australia might do. Um, Victoria, you want to add to any any of that because you helped me work through all those issue areas, everything from you know China policy to Ron DeSantis. So. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if I was to add anything, it would be, you know, in terms of the assurances of the relevance of the book and the like eternal relevance of this book, I think um, something that continually came up for me was just how much appetite there was in Trump content, in terms of Trump content by Australians. Um, at each of these developments, I keep thinking, you know, and there's been, you know, admittedly points in time where we've been working on the book and I've been like, oh, it's old news. Like, I don't think anyone really cares about Trump anymore. And something new will happen. And all of a sudden there's all this interest back in Trump. And even, you know, like Bruce said, we did that really systematic look at each individual policy area, like things down from race and abortion rights and environmental law and, you know, how our Supreme Court works and how our federal justice system works and trying to get the comparisons between Australia and the United States. And just looking at all the ways that, and, you know, from really big uh, re-evaluations to more smaller um, cultural and social trends, the ways that um, the Trump presidency did impact Australia and, um, yeah, impacted the way that Australia approaches its own policies, I think was really interesting. I, I know Austra- uh, Victoria is exactly right, and we know this from our lived experience here. When Trump was president, everyone in the country would, first of all, U.S. news dominates in the morning because it's still unfolding. In the, the, the news day has not gotten underway here, so early in the morning, what you heard every morning was what he did last night and what he said and what he tweeted. And everyone was across it and the collective blood pressure around the country was uh, off the charts. Joe Biden comes in and blood pressure returns to normal. Anxiety levels decrease. People can enjoy a walk on the beach and not worry whether the beach was going to be there tomorrow. But the, the, but the other thing that, uh, that occurred was when they would see Trump do extreme things in the United States or, or horrible things would occur like gun violence or anti-abortion laws, or Supreme Court justices. They, I, a lot of people thought, is this going to happen here? Uh, and, and they would jump to the conclusion, even though as we worked through the issues and took a look at Australia, no, Australia is not going to mimic what occurs in the United States because the democracy, the structure of Australia's democracy is profoundly different. We have guardrails, the most important being compulsory voting, and, and there are many, many others. And so those are the things we need to cherish more and strengthen more so that, in fact, if Trump comes back in a second term, uh, we are we are going to be OK in many respects, but there are still threats in several respects. It's interesting because I feel like that was such an experience of living in Australia during the Trump years that waking up to see what he tweeted and what has unfolded. And it felt like more often than not, there would be some big revelation or you at least had to check and see. Um, but it was interesting because I was in America uh, not that long before Trump was elected. And I had this experience for a while where every often I'd wake up in the morning and find out, oh, Australia has a new prime minister because they would change. There'd be these things that would move. So we went through a period where we'd move from prime minister to prime minister. And at that time, I remember thinking with the parliamentarian system, they can change prime ministers so much more easily because you vote for the party and not the person. And so at that time, I was thinking, oh, you know, voting for the party could lead to a lot of disruptive leadership. And I like the continuity of voting for one person. But now 2016 comes along and you don't have a parliamentarian system. And I think in a parliamentarian system, you wouldn't have had Trump because you'd be voting for a party, not a person. And the party would have more control over who the face of that party is, who their leadership is. Have you noticed any of those kind of comparisons between the parliamentarian system versus the American one? No, that's exactly right. If you really think about, oh my God, could Trump happen here? If you really think about the Westminster system, um, he, no one like him could, could blow in from the outside and become prime minister. The prime minister is chosen by the party that has a majority in the House of Representatives. So you have to be a member of the, of the House to be prime minister. And, and, and you have to be the head of the majority party with to be prime minister, which means that Clive Palmer is never going to be prime minister. <clears throat> Pauline Hanson is never going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, is never going to be prime minister. And so the, there is um, this insulation against radical populist forces in the leadership. The other thing is, is that the 
person who does become prime minister, having served in parliament, has been immersed in that system for some years before attaining that office. So that, that means that Australia produces experienced people to be prime minister, and experienced people do not do uh, horrifically radical things that are completely off the charts. You can have a, a, a prime minister with very conservative policies, but he knows what he's doing, like John Howard. Uh, you can, but um, not even Mark Latham, you know, was could be elected and have ultra leftist policies govern the country. So that's the starting point for how Australia is safe from a lot of these trends and and, and a political culture that produces them. I was just going to add, like, uh, I mean, there's certainly like structural things in place that mean that the United States and Australia have different, um, I guess, experiences with their leadership and the kind of people they end up voting for. And of course, compulsory voting weighs into that a lot. But perhaps this is more anecdotal. I was just thinking as well, I wonder if there's a cultural difference between the character of Australian voters and how the Australian voter views their parliament. I think in Australia, and I've kind of been thinking about this more this year, is that we quite often just take our democracy and relative stability for granted. I don't know if we, possibly because we never had really a revolution, we've never really had to fight for our freedoms. We've, you know, we don't have as much reverence for the constitution. And I think that maybe just speaks to some of the difference between the ways that Australians view their political system and Americans view their political system. And part of that sure comes down to compulsory voting and the kind of things that motivate people to vote, but also just in terms of how I feel like Australians quite often look at their leaders and see them as your mate. And I think we have that kind of element. You know, we've shortened Albanese to Albo and Scott Morrison to ScoMo. And even then, I feel like it doesn't roll off the tongue very easily to say, you know, the Honourable Mr. Anthony Albanese. You know, we much more go much more shorthand than that. And I think there's that extra level of reverence in the United States. Um, so I think there's some element in which maybe Australians can't be kind of say like can't be bothered but I don't know if we're as enamored by kind of like glorious political leaders I think we're a bit more complacent and reserved than that the other but the other piece of compulsory voting which I think really seals the deal is that uh, if everyone votes you're always going to be center left and center or center right and the an extreme on guns on abortion on uh, other issues will never uh, take hold because that will be a, a, a terribly unpopular view. So the compulsory voting ensures that Australian politics isn't shifted to the margins uh, in, in how uh, policy is in, in, into what governments do and don't do. And that is and that is truly something to cherish. It's absolutely wonderful. You always sound better singing in a choir than you do on your own. And that's what compulsory voting does. It just hits the middle point rather than getting everyone's cacophony. <laughs> And it also means that, uh, you know, a lot of people, you're right, they just don't pay attention that much, but they got to study up in the day before the election because they're going to vote on this next Saturday. And that means that there, the degree of political literacy in Australia is higher than in the United States. And that serves a good civic purpose. I think it's really helpful to understand these guardrails and the differences in, in the systems to know that in some ways there are maybe realms or zones where the Trump influence wouldn't be able to necessarily be replicated like for like in Australia. Um, but you do write a fair bit in the book about um, the impact of a Trump presidency on Australia. Um, and this is, as you mentioned earlier, this is your first book for an Australian audience. Could you tell us a little bit about the title, Trump's Australia, what the connection is between Trump and Australia? And how do you think the impacts of a second term would be different from the first? What do you think Australians should be looking for in this next year of campaigning? Um, he'll be more unleashed in the second term than in the first. It'll be more pure Trump. What he will do is apply all of his instincts on nativism, on isolationism, on um, uh, the internationalism, affecting the whole world. So Australia will find the structure of the alliances that exist today in Asia disrupted. And I think the question is, well, what's going to happen to the Quad, really? Um, what's going to happen to American troops in South Korea? What is he going to do on North Korea? He loves Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un loves him. And the other thing is he's going to um, make sure, again, because of the people he puts in place, that he's not impeded in carrying these things out. And so, uh, so what Australia needs to do in a part of the book that's just so important is to think through all these international consequences and figure out, be, be, proactive in 2024 instead of reactive in 2025 and to war game these situations. Well, what if he does this? What should we do? 
Now, Australia is already acting in, a, in, in its own interest in a way that provides some buffer against this, and particularly the foreign policy initiatives of the prime minister or the foreign minister throughout Asia. They are rebuilding ties, strengthening them, widening them, deepening them. And that Australia should do that under any circumstances, but it should especially do it uh, if um, uh, uh, because of what Trump might do to other relationships in Asia. The big question, of course, is China and Taiwan. And uh, the um, people that I talk with, the foreign policy experts I talk with, these are senior. These are people who have served in governments um, and on both sides at, at uh, high levels, and have deep experience in the region as to what they would uh, recommend. And that that was the strongest recommendation: that the best way to, to promote protect Australia's interests is for Australia to be strong in its own right, its diplomacy, national security policy, security strategy in the region. So they're doing that. But some things are bigger than Australia, and China certainly is. And and so we we talked about, well, what might Trump do with China? And where, where does Taiwan come in? And and again, you got to, th- so, so to think that through. So that's, that's one half of the examination. The other half of the examination is what happens to the relationship, the alliance between Australia and the United States, if Trump dismantles us, American democracy, if he really does take apart uh, the institutions that make America, America, to the extent where you have more of an autocracy in the White House than a democracy expressed in the White House, and that America is no longer regarded as being a democratic nation. Now, Australia has an alliance with the United States because we share values, of which the most fundamental is belief in democracy and adherence to it. So if America is no longer a democratic country, or or it looks headed that way, uh, why should Australia be aligned? For what reason are we principally aligned with the United States? And I think that will raise serious questions here about the where we stand with the United States. And that has profound, I call them existential consequences. And so I wanted people to start thinking about that. Mm. And I mean, Victoria, as an Australian hearing this, how do you think that message of um, being prepared in 2024 rather than reactive in 2025, how do you think Australians will receive that message? Yeah, I think... Oh gosh, there's so many, I think it depends firstly on the individual, but I think coming out of the 2016 election, one of the quips that I heard was that, you know, people took him literally, but not seriously. And we needed to take him seriously, but not literally. Perhaps that's the other way around. That's something to do with being serious and literal. And I think that's where this comes in as well, is that um, everyone at this point in at least my conversations, both at, you know, at, at the public level with my friends and family and then, you know, in terms of the high level engagement as well, it's really easy to dismiss how serious his intentions to run are. And I think as well, it's really easy to discount Trump as a popular candidate and just say, well, you know, on mass, he doesn't have enough support. He's weighed down by all these legal indictments. It's going to be really hard for him to campaign. He can't do it. But it's so easy to underestimate Trump. And in the end, you know, something like 43,000 votes came between Joe Biden and Trump in 2020, which is not a lot. And and I don't think any of many of us saw January 6th coming either. And so I think on all those kind of like, in those instances, it's really easy to, you know, we've had a bit of time and distance now, and it's kind of easy to dismiss Trump as this fast school thing of the past. But we do need to take him seriously. We need to take his campaign seriously. We need to take this second federal indictment, but also the state level indictment seriously, all of these things are incredibly disruptive. And I think something that keeps coming up in this conversation is just questions. And for me, that was a really interesting thing coming out of the research in this, and especially with that elite group of experts, is that the one thing that was predictable is Trump's unpredictability. And for Australia, our national interest really depends on a stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific And as Bruce said, it means that we've had to consider stepping up, um, redoubling our efforts in international institutions, redoubling our efforts in terms of how we engage with the countries in our region and how we can help, you know, contribute more to the stability of the region. Um, And I mean, perhaps it's useful to also say that I think Australians are wary of what a second Trump term might involve, um, whether or not they're taking that seriously. When we asked in our public opinion polling last year, compared to the United States where 40% of the American public said that a second Trump term would be good for America. In Australia, only 26% said that that would be a good thing. Um, and there's also a slight discrepancy between a Labor uh, Labor voters and coalition voters in Australia in terms of who are thinking that 
a second Trump term would be a good thing. And, you know, for Labor voters, 62% said it would be a bad thing. And of that 62%, 46% said it would be a very bad thing. So in terms of understanding some of these consequences, I think Australians are aware, but whether or not we're taking it seriously enough right now, I mean, I think people are shocked when I say to them, the chances of Trump getting re-elected at this point are about 50-50 because we just don't know. And you don't know what seats he's going to win in the Electoral College. Again, after the midterms, it's really, really easy to dismiss him and to dismiss his power. But as far as my assessments go, I don't think he's going anywhere, as we said. And that so long as he's not going anywhere, we would be foolish to repeat the mistakes of 2016 and not take him seriously, but take him literally. Um, And Bruce, you touched on this already. I'm keen to dig a little bit more into um, both the foreign policy aspect of the book and then also the domestic side of things. But I know that you I know that you interviewed many experts in both the US and Australia around US foreign policy, the bilateral alliance, how the Trump presidency impacted Australia. But one of the things you note was there was this really resounding consensus, this, you know, Osman chorus, all very much singing from the same song sheet around the impacts of Trump on foreign policy. Could you just talk us through some of those points of consensus that you saw these emerging themes from your discussions? All these people observed or had direct experience with Trump uh, in the first term, and they came away feeling he's extremely narcissistic, he's unstable, he's erratic, he's chaotic. I mean, he had, from the numbers of chiefs of staff, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, national security advisors, they had never seen anything like it. They knew he was capable of being arbitrary, capricious, arbitrary at any moment. He could reverse on a dime, uh, and 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 so you, the only thing you could do is expect the unexpected and deal with it. What was it? It really was terrific that the the two prime ministers, the two ambassadors, could uh, knew it could be contained. The damage could be contained, even though there was some collateral damage, and that and uh, I think they're afraid that if he comes back. Be, because he will act in a more determined fashion to see his vision through, that he won't be able to be contained, and that, they, that he will make decisive, take decisive actions he was unable to complete in the first term. Really, and these uh, the people I talked with were from both part, you know, represented uh, governments from both parties, Democratic, Republican, liberal, labor over many, many years. And what did they have? They have Australia's best interests at heart. So they're really talking as patriots, if you will. The best scenario is Australia continues to work with, uh, in alliance with the United States because they stand for the same things and want the same things in this world. But if one side says, I'm not interested in that anymore, that's where it really gets tough. Uh, one other point on the Osmian course, I did not talk with anyone serving in office today. Uh, I, I didn't, t- because generally, you know, like you look at TV interviews with government officials, you get talking points. I didn't want talking points. I wanted real views as to what um, people thought. And so these were veterans who had been there, done that, and then they could really reflect more candidly on what we should do, what what we're facing, what we should do. Can I, sorry, can I just crowbar in something in terms of that? I think as well, crowbar away. I think um, one of the uh, other points from that Osmin chorus that I thought was interesting and possibly reassuring, and I think it's important to say, is that sure, it's going to be tough, um, you know, re- you know, re-engaging with this level of unpredictability as we talked about, but it's not broken and it's not impossible. And Trump is one part of our relationship with America. So, you know, the the executive office, the president is one component of the US-Australian relationship, but our ties go beyond that presidential office. We have trade ties. Um, we have a long history of serving together militarily and Congress as well. And we saw that step up in that 2017 to 2021 period as well, that kind of like sub, um, uh, I suppose, sub-executive level uh, engagement and the ways that different executive officers engaged with our executive officers. So it's definitely not beyond hope. And I think that that was also resounding out of the Osman chorus that it's not, uh, you know, the um, alliance isn't broken. Um, and sure, it exposed ways that we need to deepen cooperation in different areas to work. And we will continue to work closely with the United States, um, regardless of who is in office. Mm. And in the second part of the book, you take a look at more like the domestic side of the heart of some of the key political, social, cultural differences between the United States uh, and Australia on things like race, voting rights, abortion rights. Um, And you're also quoted um, in some of your promos for the book around not understanding how we could move from the racial unity moment under President Obama to President Trump. That's the very next president elected. Um, And I myself have wondered some very 
similar questions. I've been thinking through that a lot over the past how many years, six, seven years now since Trump. Um, and there was this very interesting episode of Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History podcast that was about this topic, um, but also the concept of moral licensing, how when we do something good or virtuous, we feel that it gives us then permission to do something a bit less good. I've eaten my broccoli, so now I can have my chocolate cheesecake. I've given, I now have permission to do this other thing because I did a good thing. And they were saying that that psychology probably played a factor in terms of voting and feeling like we did this great thing. We elected our first black president and then we've had this unifying moment. And then maybe people felt more permission or free to vote for a character like Trump. Um, do you think this could be part of the psychology driving that drastic change from Obama to Trump? And would you mind talking a little further about how Trump illuminated some of these differences during his term, especially around key flashpoints like Black Lives Matter um, or even watershed moments that happened after his term, like we saw with the SCOTUS decision on abortion. If, if you look at um, the election of 2016, that I take the only thing I can take comfort for in the election of 2016 is that um, uh, Hillary Clinton got three million more popular votes than Donald Trump, but she could not become president because of the Electoral College. So the country actually voted to continue uh, uh, racial amity uh, and not go down that road. But because of the Electoral College, Trump became president. And um, I think it was Noel Pearson who said, uh, I haven't been able to verify this, but I go back to the 90s and it's something that Noel Pearson said, which was uh, leaders have the ability to push your good button or your bad button. Everyone has two buttons, a good button and a bad button. And leaders know how to push the ones they want. And Trump wants to push the bad button. That's what he and that's what he does. And and so he brings out uh no, I, I mean, I, no, I don't think most people of goodwill say I've done my goodwill gym work today and now I'm just going to, you know, pig out on a you know, salted caramel. I don't think that happens. So, uh, so I think most of the country did want to. Yes, there were challenges, uneasy and stuff like that, hard, but they did want to um, continue on, but they were unable to. So th so Trump comes in, pushes the bad buttons and here we are. And uh, on issues there, what Australia serves as what Australia is on news coming out of the U.S. is an echo chamber. We wake up, as we've talked before, every morning we hear these terrible things. So George Floyd occurs. And uh, and then people then look at police violence against uh, First Nations peoples across the country. Well, are there parallels? Yeah, there are parallels. And, you know, it, 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 then there are other, uh, the, the gun violence in the United States, uh, absolutely horrible. But it doesn't happen here because of gun laws. Um, abortion uh, rulings in the United States. They happen over there. Here, the laws are much more protective of a woman's right to choose, and they're going to stay that way. So, But what Trump can do is keep pushing bad buttons that will have an effect here, particularly, I think, on two things, race and media. Uh, he can push the other buttons as well, but I think the guardrails are in place. And on race, we're at a moment as well here on the uh, racial equity for the future in The Voice. And I think the best protection against Trump influences in really uh, agitating, getting people agitated about people of color is to pass the voice as an affirmation of what Australia stands for. So Australia's democracy is basically in, it is intact, and, uh, but we can do more to be vigilant about uh, what, it, what comes across uh, every morning uh, on the airwaves. Mm. And in, if we look at 2024, so far it is shaping up to be a rematch of Trump versus Biden um, by the poll numbers we see right now. But as we have seen in recent times, Trump is increasingly embroiled in legal trouble, um, which could make a presidential campaign hard. Um, so if he somehow does not end up um, acceding to be the nominee for the GOP next year, what is going to happen to Trump's ideas and policies? You ask toward the ends of the book, is Trump an ism? Um, the question of can Trump's style of politics and policy priorities last without him uh, leading them? What did you end up deciding? Is Trumpism more than Trump? And are there others who would carry Trump's legacy forward? If uh, Trump is not the nominee, but um, someone like Ron DeSantis or Tim Scott is the nominee, uh, they will have predominance. The nominee will have predominance over policy. I think in order to keep Trump's base intact and behind them, they will um, 
uh, talk to many of the many of the priorities that Trump has. Where they actually execute on them is another matter down the road. But the ultimate way to defeat Trump and Trumpism is to is for Republicans to be beaten at the ballot box until those tendencies are beaten out of them in their public life and their political life. So it'll take successive defeats to take the most extreme aspects of Trump policy and just wash them out of the Republican Party. Republican Party, it will always be a conservative party. That's fine. It, but it's, it's whether it's an extreme party that becomes difficult. The other thing is, though, if you don't have Trump in office, but you have Ron DeSantis, as aggressive as he is, he's still an institutionalist in more respects than Trump ever was or will be. And so it comes down to, like, like the question of Australia, can you manage this or does it get out of control? And I think um, the, uh, I, I think uh, a President DeSantis will be manageable, even there will be many things that occur that people are unhappy about, as opposed to what Trump would do. So, so I, think that's how, I think that's how it plays out. Um, the, 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 what could happen, though, because Trump, he never concedes defeat. I mean, I can't wait for the Florida primary where uh, it's, it's DeSantis versus Trump. DeSantis wins, and Trump says this was stolen from me. This was <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it, it didn't happen. Hoax. Um, it is possible that Trump, facing defeat for nomination, will say, "I'm still running for president anyway as an independent," and split the Republican vote. That is a an outside possibility. And uh, let me tell you this: even Joe Biden can win that election. <laughs> um, and I guess just to wrap up, Victoria, as a young part of a younger generation of Australian voters, where did you end up landing on the question of Trumpism? Um, and how much of an impact do you think it will have on Australia going forward? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. I think I think when it comes to Trump, I don't know if there's, I mean, I'll have to look up the numbers, but I don't think there's a huge difference between how younger voters view um, a second Trump term versus the rest of the country. I think as from an Australian perspective, I think most young Australians are kind of aligned with the rest of the population in um, viewing it as, a, you know, quite disruptive to Australia. Um, but I think, you know, looking at how Trump has impacted America and also the US-Australian relationship, I think from an Australian perspective, it's a, um, a moment to reflect on what we have and the kind of institutions and structures and culture that we have that's different to the United States that you know, protects us and that we like and that is uniquely Australian. And I think as an Australian working on the book, it's been actually an encouragement to double down on the things that make our country good and different and, um, you know, are the guardrails for our democracy and help people, you know, vote for leaders that they want to represent them and their interests and that produces policy that produces good outcomes for the citizens. And I think um, all of those things are a good Thing for Australians to stop and think about what they want in their country and how they can make contributions to, you know, create the country that they they want to see. So I think from a younger Australian perspective, you know, I, I hope that my generation will be around here for quite a long time and we're going to face huge challenges, um, you know, uh, and this period of tumult is just one of those periods of, um, of times of change and challenge that we're going to have to face in our lifetime. So I'm hoping that Australians take away from this book and especially young Australians that we need to invest heavily in institutions that help us be the country that we want to be. And now, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, I'm keen to get a by the numbers factor stat from each of you related to your book, Trump's Australia. Um, I think I'll start with you, Bruce. What did you choose? Well, one of my favorite statistics in the book is that Trump, by uh, count of accurate fact checkers, has lied 30,000 times during the first film. On 30,000 occasions, he told lies. Um and, but I also say, and I catch a lot of hell for saying this, I say, even though he's told 30,000 lies in his time as president, he's the most relentlessly honest president we've ever experienced. And he's relentlessly honest because he does what he says he's going to do. He never deviated. He never broke a major promise. If anything, he championed everything he said he wanted to do. He went on guns, on the Supreme Court, on abortion, on radicalism, social, you know, everything. And uh, that... Um, you may not like it, but you sure as hell have got to respect it. And uh, and I think that's a secret of his of the support of his base. He's never turned on them. He never has sacrificed an interest of his base 
in order to stay in power. He says, I am you. This is why when he says, when they're coming after me, they're coming after you. And they, and that is as potent a political statement as I've heard in a long time. And it's working for him. And that's why they're out there. So he will keep lying every day. I, look at Caitlin Collins on the town hall in New Hampshire. I mean, she fact-checked him every 30 seconds. His crowd loved it. And he won the night. And he won biggest, uh, biggest uh, ratings for CNN. And, uh, it, and that, it works. He, he is quite a cunning individual. And uh, he knows how to wield exactly what he wants to do to keep power. Hmm. And how about you, Victoria? Um, what's your by the numbers stat? My by the numbers stat is uh, Trump's Australia book adjacent. It's um, zero to three percent, which is um, represents the kind of if we're talking about the primary elections for next year, the kind of Republican candidates that could exceed to become the presidential nominee for that party. I think it's useful to think of them as three buckets. There's Trump, which is bucket one, and then there's DeSantis, bucket two. And the last bucket is zero to three percent, which includes the other ten candidates so far to date who have put their name to run for that election, and each of them only have somewhere between zero to three percent of um, uh, support from the Republican base, which is a very, very, very low chance of becoming a nominee ahead of Ron DeSantis and ahead of Donald Trump. And of course, anything could happen. Uh, you know, we're still a fair way out from uh, the next election, let alone the primary vote. But I think it's really, again, in terms of taking that Trump's potential pres second presidency uh, seriously, I think it's important to actually look at the amount of uh, support that he has from that key voter base and looking at the fact that 10 of those Republican presidential candidates in a very, very crowded primary don't have any more than 3% of favour among that base uh, makes, you know, makes him all the more likely to be the one to become the nominee next year. Yeah. Sure. Huh. And I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, a year from now, from when we're recording this, um, we'll be at the tail end of the primary season and gearing up for the conventions. Um, and unless we have what used to be more common in primary season, where maybe after Super Tuesday or, you know, some of the early states, all of a sudden someone comes out as a strong victor and then you know who the candidate is. And the last few election cycles, it's drawn out longer and longer and gotten closer and closer to the event convention. So a year from now, it's probably around the time we'll have some clarity around who is that uh, Republican nominee. And is it Trump? Is it DeSantis? Or can someone from that zero to three bucket rise up and surprise us? We'll see. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm not sure if I'm feeling more optimistic or pessimistic about 2024, but I do feel like I'm going to enter it with eyes wide open. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Great honor. Thank you so much, Mari. Thank you uh, very much. And um, just as we wrap up, I'd like to point out a couple of other podcasts that may be of interest to our audience. We have our technology and security podcast, TS, run by Dr. Mia Hammond-Airy, USSC's Director of Emerging Technology, as well as our USSC Live series that runs recordings from our major live events. Recent episodes include our readout from White House National Security Council staff Kurt Campbell, Edgar Kagan, and Mira Rapp Hooper, and an interview with Qantas CEO Ellen Joyce and former U.S. Ambassador John Barry, and our researcher re responses to the AUKUS report. You can find these on our website, ussc.edu.au, or wherever you get your podcasts.